Welcome home, family. Today's discussion is going to water the garden of your personal progression and tidy up the office of your career choices. With me is Colin Rocker, first-time professional, social media influencer, and a leading consultant for some of the country's biggest brands and corporations. Get creative, look for third doors, and like proximity is, is, is power, especially if you're trying to get a job. You need to get off the internet and go like meet people face to face. If you can't illustrate to a person where you need them to be, you can't expect them to sort of wake up and say, you know, I got it right via osmosis and I'm just gonna, you know, create the, the result you want for me. I don't think your career should define your identity, but there can be parts of your identity. Like I think it has to go in the other direction because I know who I am and what, I, what value I bring to the world. I've chosen to pursue this professional path and I know I'm damn good at it and so I'm going to pursue it. So I think the best the best time to prepare to get a corporate career is probably Welcome home family. You are in the inspired house. I am your host Desmond Davis. And I do this all the time. I know I'm like, yo, we got one for you. But family, we have a banger for you. I am so excited to have our guest, Colin Rocker, here. And for those of you who may not know, which I would be surprised if if there's a ton of folk who don't know, my man has been doing amazing work, kind of putting us on to the life of what it looks like to be a consultant. And y'all, I I don't want to spoil anything, just... Just know y'all about to get some of that 30,000 foot game and just you're welcome. All right. So I want to present to some and introduce to others, Colin Rocker. Bro, how are you, man? Desmond, I'm doing fantastic. I I appreciate the intro. Uh, Thank you so much for reaching out and I'm really happy to be here. My man. Hey, thank you so much for coming on, bro. I've been watching the, the stuff that you do on social media and, um, one of your one of your videos um popped up in my algorithm and I was I was listening and and you hooked me like that of just breaking down what it means to be a, a consultant and and to be a professional and I think there's so many people who kind of wish they had someone who can spit that game to them and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut up and I would just love for you to just introduce yourself to the audience and introduce yourself to the inspired community Awesome. Yeah, no, happy, happy to do so. So hello, everyone. Uh, Hello, inspired community. I love that. Uh, My name is Colin Rocker, also known on the internet as Career Colin. Uh, I am a 20, now 28, but attained the title of a senior manager at 27 years old, uh, currently in marketing and advertising, but I've had a successful career across, as you mentioned, uh, consulting as well as venture-backed startups here in New York City. Uh, but I did not start out that way. So my dad was uh, a plumber. Uh, my mom taught elementary school. And, you know, I, I really had to sort of build up my persona as sort of this first generation professional and, and getting the the confidence, the skill set, the, the communication skills, the the styling, you know, and, and all this stuff I really had to build from scratch. But through kind of my approach of, you know, personal development, uh, networking, vulnerability, um, and really improving who I was, I was able to uh, you know, come on the other side of my career and start to build a successful uh, brand for myself. And so I've, you know, I've, I've given a TED talk, my elevator pitch has won awards. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky enough now on social media under that banner of career colon to share out uh, my career as well as my personal sort of um, strategies for success with a global community of over 265,000 people. So excited to be here, man. Man. That all right? That elevator pitch is fire. Like, like I, I love it. I'm like, I'm sitting here. I'm like, I didn't even know that. Hold up, wait, what? What? Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Let's do that it. That is amazing. So, so then let, let's just get right into it. So, you mentioned being in the consulting space, being a senior level, uh, being a senior manager. You said yes. Okay, and you also did, did I hear you? We said. You're a part of two startups, or you have two startups. I've I've been no goodness. You're you're giving me more credit here. I I, I used to work for a startup here in New York City. That's just a previous oh. job I've held. Yeah. Okay. Fire. Fire. Yeah. So then, with with all of that, you've you've kind of had a wide range of experience at such a young age. Like in in it's like I've I rarely talk to folk who are younger than me, and so like. It's like, wow, like that, bro, you've done a lot in like a short amount of time. 
what would you say has been your greatest success thus far? Greatest success? I think I think all of my successes have really come from just self-awareness and really doubling down on a set of skills that I think I, in most cases, do better than most people. And so I, I can't really mm-hmm. point to one one exact moment, one exact accomplishment, right? Because I feel like, you know, the second you, you get it, it's always like, okay, what's next, right? And that's, that's, that's my perspective, at least. But I think, um, you know, some of my skills that I think I've developed over time are, I'm an incredibly good communicator. Uh, I think I build teams really effectively. And I'm really good at setting uh, a mission and a goal for people to work towards and for people to feel like, you know, you're not just coming to work to create some widgets or do some designs or something, you're actually moving towards something that's a lot more meaningful. Um, And I think I'm very good at managing up as well as managing down, which is sort of related to the communication piece. But a lot of people think, you know, uh, they're not managers until they have sort of a team around them, but that's actually not true. You have to manage the relationship between you and your manager. And for me now, between my directors and my VPs, right? So I think those are sort of the, those are the skills that have led to the biggest successes in my life. But to be honest, I mean, just like things I'm proud of. I mean, I, at, at 27, I was able to start uh, a scholarship at my high school, like, you know, back home in, in Georgia, like I'm really proud of that moment. Um, I'm really proud of the community I built online, just sort of uh, ranting into my cell phone, you know, for the first few years in terms of, uh, you know, some some quick tips and tactics in, in terms of uh, what people can use to get successful in their careers. And so those are the things that I would say, I'm probably the most proud of, but yeah, I can't say there's one exact moment where, you know, I can say like, wow, like that's success, you know? Hmm. Wow. So if, if you can't put your, your finger on one specific thing and then you follow it up and name like a plethora of things. I'm like, okay, (laughs) like that's, that's, that's fine. That's great, bro. What, what then is kind of your motivation behind chasing after the things that you're chasing after? a good question and and to be honest i you know it's it's changed i would say like you know when i was when i was young and i think a lot of people goodness i hope you can't hear that too bad that's my radiator here in new york but um i think when i was young like i I just really wanted to make money right and so i think that's the initial and and again that's that's a fair you know it's a valid thing to to strive for and that goal certainly hasn't gone away but like that's what sort of drew me into my first job in, in consulting and, and wanting to do that in New York City, you know, sort of the, the major leagues of that, of that industry. Um, I think now I'm driven by a couple of things. And I would say, for whatever reason, like I've always wanted to be, I don't want to do anything unless I'm pursuing like excellence within it. And so I think there's a certain level of like personal standard of like, whatever job I have, like, I want to make sure I'm good at that job. But to be honest now, like, especially given that the community I have online, like I'm, I'm really driven to be a, a, a model or an image for others in terms of, okay, if, if he can do it, you know, maybe I can do what I want to do in my life. Right. That's why a big part of my platform online in terms of this brand of like being a first generation professional is being, first, right? And I know I'm obviously not the first consultant. I'm not the first person to work in a startup. I'm not the first person to be in advertising, but I may be the first person you see if you're on Instagram, if you're on TikTok, Mm -hmm. that's doing these positions at this level. Um, And and being, you know, relatively, from my perspective, pretty good at them. And so I think I'm, I'm incredibly driven by the comments, the emails, the texts, the DMs, the calls I get from people just saying, like, dude, like you, you inspire me. And the fact that you are doing this makes me want to go after this because, you know, um, in every job I've had, there haven't been a lot of people around that look like me. And so, you know, I'm not drawn to those environments, but I'm not afraid to be the first or one of the first people to be within them because you never know who's watching you and who can be inspired by the, you know, the image that you're putting out there. Hmm. So then knowing knowing kind of the the responsibility that you're willingly taking on you you mentioned something at the end that i i had another question but i just had to pause and just address this okay you said not maybe not necessarily looking for certain areas or certain opportunities where there's not a lot of representation but i'm not afraid of that 100 percent. what 
what that that is a very interesting kind of kind of dichotomy of having your preference but not being afraid of pursuing something where do you feel like that strength of being able to pursue and now looking at that well that's not the most ideal and looking at that as a deterrent because i i think of sometimes my clients or my mentees yeah. or folk who i know that if it's not absolutely perfect they take it as a sign not to pursue so right. what then what what do you hear that makes you say this may not be ideal but that doesn't mean it's not for me yeah i mean to to be honest i mean you know people may not know this about me but like i i'm continuously inspired by my own peer group and friend group like i think i'm incredibly lucky that you know some of the people i went to high school with a lot of the people i, I ran around with in college they are doing these things at at the highest levels higher than than even i am right and so like when I was 19, 20, 21, like I, I was able to put myself in certain situations where I saw people who looked like me that, you know, went to Harvard or went to Yale and then went and then got these super big, you know, fancy high paying jobs. And so I'm like, well, heck, like, like if they can do it, you know, why can I do it? Right. And so I, I think that, um, and that sort of, I guess, like they were at that point proving, you know, to me that what I now try to prove to others, um, I guess on, on one level too, I do think in some ways it was a blessing for me that my parents didn't work in corporate America because they didn't sort of, uh, you know, they didn't talk down about it. They didn't try to scare me away from it. Like I never had this view that, you know, white collar jobs are only for white people underneath the collars, you know? So I, I didn't have sort of that, that, that base of it, but um, yeah, that's, it's honestly a good question in terms of why I'm drawn to these environments. I mean, to be honest with you, I think, again, like, I think based on the skill set that I have, I think I'm very good at these jobs. And that's evident in terms of my, my career trajectory. But um, yeah, I think I nobody was really telling me I couldn't do it. And everything I tried to do and that I put my real self towards and really tried hard to do like I was succeeding. And so I think I built up maybe a bit of momentum early on in my career and I didn't have mm. sort of a, you know, the crabs in a bucket to, to go to that metaphor of people saying, you know, Hey, you can't do that. Hey, you shouldn't be able to do this um, in a way that was like meaningful. Like, I mean, in high school, right? Like when I tried to go for a class president, you know, people at the lunch table, they were like, Oh, only white people do class president. And I'm like, well, not anymore, you know? And then I won. Right. And so like, I think like, in life, and this is something I also say on my content, like you gotta you gotta stack small wins, you need momentum, um, you gotta be really careful with the people who you listen to. Wow. So what I'm hearing then is kind of um in your story, I'm hearing a threading of the power of one community. Totally. And and the power of what becomes tangible, what becomes doable based off of what you see around you but also kind of the the power of kind of being practicing some mindfulness and being reflective and stacking mm -hmm. those wins and stacking those things so that you kind of have this great kind of one two combo of I'm seeing folk around me who are going for it and instead of looking at that and thinking I can't do it I've take the time to reflect and in the back of my mind I'm hearing you've been stacking wins so you can do it does that sound about right That's that's dead on yeah building some momentum and then having that community. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. So then, so with having that community and now that you're managing, I'm interested to know what have been, um, has that carried over into how then you lead other people? Have there been things that with what you do and, and how you've learned to establish success, have you been able to formulate that in how you lead other people, would you say? Yeah. I mean, I think my, I would say the two pillars of kind of like, if you could call it my, my management framework or how I go about like leading my, my team, because I guess, you know, to, to put it very broadly and very simply, like I, I run a creative studio that is in charge of, you know, just over about a million dollars worth of business that I personally manage. And so I'm, I'm growing these accounts for the agency I work at, as well as managing the creative team that, you know, produces the actual assets and, you know, deliverables for that, for those, for those clients. And so I think the two things that I would say, like, you know, you'd be surprised how many leaders don't do this are trying to identify, like once you give someone something or a couple things, it's pretty easy if you're paying attention to realize what, what lights them up and what 
excites him about their job and like the, the specific items that they may or may not be like positioned well to do. And so I think you've got to nurture what they're doing well. And like one thing that was told to me was like, you've got to praise in public, right? And so if someone does something, if you have a quick win, um, like that was one of the things I implemented, like when I first started this job is like, okay, we need, I, I still haven't made a channel yet in Slack, but like we need a way to like highlight people who are doing damn good work so that they feel like reinforced and they feel good about the stuff they're doing. Because so often, especially in creative fields, they're sort of seen, the, the creatives themselves are seen as like the, you know, the, the bricklayers or like the, you know, the, just the, the workhorses, right, of this industry. And they just toss stuff over the field to, you know, people in my position and we go give it to the client. And so I think like sh taking the feedback back and like, okay, like if somebody thought you did a really good job or if I thought you did a really good job, I'm going to make sure you know that. So you get hyped up, you get excited and, um, you know, you feel uh, more, you know, excited to do more good work in the future. Like that's sort of the, the first thing um, to answer your question <laughs> kind of went off on a tangent there. No, that that's good. I'm, 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 I'm hearing. So what I'm hearing is there's this piece of making sure that you're intentionally praising yes. and you're letting people know you're, you're basically reaffirming somebody's value is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Does that sound yeah. about right? Yeah. And once you know those values, I guess, yeah, the next part of that is identifying opportunities for them to pursue those values. Like, you know, we had an opportunity where um, one of our graphic designers was helping me put together like a proposal for um, like a like a photo shoot, right? Which is something that they did a little bit in a prior job, but that wasn't necessarily the title of their role at the current company where we both work. But it's it was obviously clearly something that she was passionate about. And so I went to bat for her and, you know, talked to my creative directors who were sort of her, you know, direct manager, line manager and said, hey, like, can, you know, can we identify a way or can we create some opportunities for her to continue to do this work? Because it's clearly something she's passionate about. Right. And so I think mm -hmm. like if you're paying attention, people, people are always communicating to you how they want to be perceived and what they ought to be doing. Right. Especially, I mean, not especially at work, I guess, but like that's just how people react right and so if you're keyed into the verbals and the non-verbals like that um you can pick up on those things and then if you go out of your way to give them opportunities to do the work they want to be doing well they'll want to work with you more and they'll work harder and more passionately for you than maybe other people so yeah mm, i like that i like how seeing the values and seeing then how that plays out in providing opportunities for those values to shine and you said something that if you pay attention, people will tell you what they're passionate about. People will tell you what people will put out what they want you to see. And I think we Absolutely. make the mistake of assuming that's only in social media. Yeah. When it exists, it existed well before social media, right? That's why we call it putting our best foot forward. Go ahead. You totally. want to say something? Well, I was, I was going to say in, in nine times out of 10, Desmond, like it, it's non verbal, it's subconscious. Like they may not even be intentionally telling you that I'm, that I'm really excited about art directing or I really want to do photography, right? Or some, you know, other example that's specific to your industry. Like people will just, you'll, you'll see their eyes light up. You'll see their shoulders move back. You'll see them lean in, you know, maybe to the conversation. Like, people are subconsciously always giving us signals, whether they are clued in or zoned out of like whatever interaction they're having. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So then body language becomes really important in totally. having that mindfulness. So you, you mentioned before we started, you mentioned how you kind of have a practice of really focusing in and having that one-on-one -on -one time with yourself and I think I would love to maybe if you want to share a little bit of that, because sure. I think it goes in really powerfully with you were talking about body language and the subconscious things and maybe sharing a little bit about what you do in the morning or what you do kind of that one on one time that I think has benefited subconsciously so that you're putting your best foot forward. Would you want to share a little bit about that? Of course. Yeah. So uh, I'll say for for the vast majority of my career, more so than what I'm about to tell you. Like I, I let my career happen to me. And so I woke up and I dived into emails. I woke up and I dived into Slack. I woke up and dived into a meeting and I really didn't give myself the time or create the space before my work day to get right mm -hmm. up here so that I could handle the stuff that was thrown at me. Right. And that works 
for a time and I was young and I was hungry and I wanted to prove myself, but there comes a point where, you know, in terms of what your, what your mandate is and what you have to accomplish in any given day, you need to put on some armor and just be ready for, you know, anything that could possibly happen. Right. And so I think there have been a couple of times in my career where, because I didn't take the time beforehand to make sure that I was right or that I was dealing with stress in the right way, my body took me out of work and said, okay, you are now like, you're done. We're going to take you back. Right. And so then you get, you know, you get a migraine or like you can't work in the right way or like you can't handle stress in the proper way. And you have to now, like your body will take time back if you don't intentionally, you know, um, arm yourself on a day in day out basis in terms of that mindfulness. And so what I try to do now is as often as I can, like not, every, it's not every day. I won't say that, you know, I'm not one of these morning routine guys, but like, I like to, to journal, you know, and so I'll, I'll take out a little journal, say, you know, I'll, I'll capture the moment. And so I just write down literally just like facts about where I am, where I'm sitting, what the weather's like outside, how I'm feeling and just like take stock and take inventory of anything that may come up just in a few sentences. Right. And then I'll try to think of three things I want to accomplish and three things I'm grateful for, because I think that, you know, the, with, if you allow yourself to stack like stresses and like the, the difficulties and the complexities, right. Are, you know, our lives, like you, you can sort of forget about like how amazing your life is and everything that's in 28 year old Colin's life, 18 year old Colin would have killed for. Right. And like, I, I wanted this apartment. I wanted this shirt. I wanted this haircut. Right. Like I wanted this opportunity to share, you know, my life with people like you and, in, 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 you know, in these platforms. So I think once you, uh, regularly remind yourself of that, it makes it a little easier and it makes it a little harder to get stressed and worried about certain things, you know? And so I think like mm. taking the time before my day to sort of look at myself in the mirror and sometimes I don't write it down, but I'll look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, like, how are you feeling? how awesome and grateful and incredible is the life you've built for yourself thus far. And then what are we trying to get out of today? Right. And so like, if you set yourself like that, kind of like a clock, right. If you set the clock every day, like you can, you can deal with most of what life throws at you. And at least in my life, you know, I've really been able to, so yeah, that's the, that's the practice mm -hmm. that I put into play um, really seriously in the last couple of months, to be honest with you. And I've seen it pay out um, dividends. Cause I would say this, this current role is, probably the most responsibility I've had and in, in the most sort of in terms of what I need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. But I feel like I'm able to handle it so much better because I just feel tuned and like ready for like whatever, you know, life can throw at me. Hmm. I, I appreciate how you broke that down and how the, the getting things right here and lining up and kind of getting yourself sorted so that your career isn't, you you said that before your career was something that was happening to you yeah instead of you having that control and taking control of that and then the the steps in which you're talking through and walking through i think are so important because that's oftentimes i think the the struggle and, and maybe you agree or disagree but i think that's the struggle with new professionals totally. that the folk that i like coach they're they're struggling with navigating and figuring out what their journey or their path is but they're not taking none of the one-on-one -on -one self time to get up here right totally. so that they can get clarity on what those steps look like. And they end up in that situation where their career and life is something that's happening to them instead of it being something that they're navigating through and walking through and by default enjoying. And, and so I guess with, with the teams and stuff that you lead, what do you do? when you see that maybe somebody on your team is their career, I'm, I'm going to use that language. I'm, I'm going to let yeah. you know now. Um, I have the, I have the rule of three where okay. I'll be like, you know, Colin said uh, this idea of your career is something that's happening to you. That'll be the first time. The second time I'm going to be like, you know, somebody said one time that you're, that if you're not careful, your career will be happening to you. The third time, I'm going to let you know now, I'm going to be like, you know, what I've discovered is if you're not careful, <laughs> your career is something that's going to happen. I you. see. Okay. Okay. That's right. Fair. Just, just, just letting you know. I'll so, take it as but, a compliment. But, my man. So yeah. what do you do when you see that somebody on your team, their career is something, is something that's happening to them? How, yeah. how do you respond as a manager, as a yeah. leader? I think that's it's a really good question. I mean, 
what I've, what I've learned is that nine times out of 10, if you have someone on your team who is not, you know, performing at the, the level in which you feel they should, or that, you know, they should be for the role that they have, it almost always has nothing to do with the actual job. It's not because they have to come into the office. Mm-hmm. It's not because they don't like the coffee. Like it is almost always something that is going on that, that they may not even let you know, right? It may be something that's quite, quite personal, right? They may be really struggling yeah. with someone. Could be a breakup, could be something going on in the family or in their personal life that they're not keying you in on. But I think um, the things that I've done in that area is again, like to what I said earlier, key in to the, the subconscious nonverbals, right? And so like, how are they showing up on calls? Um, how are they showing up at work? You know, if you, if you are in an environment where they're coming in, where you can sort of visually observe them, right? How are they speaking? You can tell in their voice when someone is feeling, um, you know, burdened heavily by, by what they're doing at work. Um, and then, you know, I, the opposite of praising in public, right? Is like when you need to have a conversation with someone, like you want to do that in an isolated environment where they feel safe, right? And so it's like, it's going to get a coffee or if it's virtual, it's, you know, huddling up, you know, one-on-one for a couple and just trying to get a read, you know, ask, ask them, you know, Hey, I've, I've, I've noticed X, Y, and Z. I just wanted to ask, or even, you know, you don't have to lay out your evidence, but just say like, Hey, like, where are you? Like, tell me about like where you are, how you're feeling about work. Um, and they'll, they'll go to the level of depth that they are comfortable sharing with you. And you don't need to know all the details. It's not your role as a manager. Um, But then the biggest thing I encourage them to do is to actually take that time into like, if if they need it, because, you know, I've definitely been in situations where, you know, I've lost um, family members and I've gone through personal things where it's like, I've, I've done both. uh, I've done both strategies. I've tried to sort of like white knuckle and work myself through it did not work. <laughs> but the times when I actually like, you know, I took a step back and I took that time out in most companies that are run by, you know, sane and non-sociopathic individuals, right? Like they'll encourage you to take that time. Um, but you gotta, you gotta step away, right? It's like the last question, like if you don't, like if you don't intentionally take that time to reset, your body will take you out of the game at a time that is not conducive to you. And I've had it happen a couple times where it's like, I like, you know, I have a really bad migraine or something happens where like physically you, you know, you get that brain fog, right. And like your body says, like, it'll take you out if you don't take yourself out. And so I think, mm. yeah, you gotta, you gotta recognize it. You gotta isolate them and ask them what's up. And then if it's, if it's something that's heavy and if it's something that's going to, you know, really cause an issue, like they, they need to, they need to take the time. Um, and if it's not personal, if it's not something that's like crushing emotionally and maybe it's, it's a pure performance issue, Right. I mean, then it's like, it's kind of a separate, you know, set of approaches and you really have to understand, okay, you know, is there a misalignment in terms of, you know, what the expectations are Um, and then give them something to model behavior to, because one thing that I didn't appreciate, you know, when I was sort of younger and more junior in my career and the times where I wasn't, you know, up to, up to the task of something, I felt like the better managers had a good way of like, modeling out or giving me an example like hey look like this is this is where you are and i need you here right and so like if you you know if you can't illustrate to a person where you need them to be you can't expect them to sort of wake up and say you know i got it right via osmosis and i'm just gonna you know create the the result you want for me so if it is purely performance Mm -hmm. i would say like you need an example to model otherwise you just gotta you know work the the personal side of it out wow um um I'm hearing um, with what you're saying, some stuff, I think it was Simon Sinek who talked about how in the workspace before it used to be that maybe you got your sense of meaning at church, you got your socialness mm-hmm. at the bowling alley, your work, you you know, you're, you're getting your money and stuff. You got that while doing work, your sense of connection with your friends or your family. And now this kind of new idea of work, like there's almost this expectation that all of that is found in work sometimes. Yeah. And well, I saw that face. What do you think? You you disagree? (laughs) I think um, to be honest, I mean, look, I mean, people, people have the right to, to build their identities in the way they want to. I've, I've realized that like, it can't be like, I don't know, like it's got to come from, 
inside of you. It, your your value and your identity can manifest in how you show up at work, but I don't think it. To be honest with you, and you know, I know it's half of my name on social media, but like, I don't think your career should define your identity. But there can be parts of your identity. Like, I think it has to go in the other direction. Whereas, because I know who I am and what I, what value I bring to the world. I've chosen to pursue this professional path and I know I'm damn good at it. And so I'm going to pursue it. Not that, you know, because I'm an attorney or because I'm at Google, right. I'm so special because I'll, I'll let you finish your thought, but I've definitely met people that like, again, like I, like I've been fired, right. People are getting fired. Like you, you could lose that role. And I have seen incredibly extreme examples of people who tied their entire identity to not only just their professional position, but the exact organization, the exact company, the exact title that they had. And when they lose that, as any of us can at any moment, right? Especially in this economy, like, like they, they crumble, right? Because they don't have the, the backing. They, don't, they didn't look in the mirror. They didn't you know, get set. They didn't prepare themselves. They didn't know who they were. And so once you lose that title, you lose a big sense of, of who you are, right? Mm, okay, here's something. Don't. Like, don't put your identity in something that can be taken away from you, I guess, is what I would say. Like, it's got to come from here and then. Yeah, that'll be a clip, right? That's a clip. Oh, that's <laughs> like <good>. that. Yeah. <laughs> don't put your identity in something yeah. that can be taken away from you. Yo, mm-hmm. again, rule of three. Just throwing that out there. Just letting you know ahead of time, man. Okay. So, so I love that then. So does... Does that concern you as someone who is leading teams at a high level when you see someone who is like their work is their identity? Mm. And is that something you talk with them about? Or do you feel like that's not your place? What would you say if you see someone that's like, because again, if if work is their identity, they're also probably given that output and probably doing good work. But you also see kind of like, mm, you're yeah. like, what does your life look like outside of work? Or do that's you a, not touch that? It's <laughs> a good, um, these are good questions. I mean, look, I mean, on, on some level, like a lot of people I work with are definitely like on the younger side. And so they got that Gen Z attitude of like, okay, 501. All right. You know, <laughs> let's, True. let's get to, True. you know, let's get to the life part of work, right. Or, or the after part of work, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and that's, you know, a, a separate mindset, which is fine. But um, I think um, as a manager, I definitely and intentionally set boundaries with the people I lead to let them know that like, you know, because sometimes you need that extra effort. And so you may go after someone who, because of how they identify and how they see work, they're going to give you, you know, a little bit more or a little bit extra to get something over the line. But Mm -hmm. I think you need to earn that ability to be able to ask that of that person. Whereas in, you know, peace times, if you will, or like business as usual, like you're setting healthy boundaries, right? Like one thing a manager told me that was like a crazy piece of advice was like, you know, if it can wait until like 5 PM, it can wait until 9 AM, like in most cases, right? I know sometimes you're working on proposals and other Mm -hmm. things that are actually due when they're due. But like, if you can't get that thing out by the actual, like, end of business, close of business, right? Like don't stress yourself. Like if you send someone an email at 8.30 PM, they're not reading it at 8.32, right? They're going to open their laptop and they're going to send it at nine. And so I think like you've got to be able to set those boundaries with the people you work with because one, it's it's healthy and it makes you a good manager. And two, being real, right? In the moments where you need that extra effort, you've now built up enough trust to be able to make that ask of them without it seeing, uh, seeming like, you know, you're trying to take advantage of somebody. Hmm. I, I like that. So putting in that social currency so that you can withdraw from that when you need to. And so what are ways then you, bro, I, I have a whole list of questions, but bro, you give us such good stuff that I keep having these follow up. <laughs> okay. What are ways that you as a leader build that social currency so that if you have to, that if you need to call in that ask, you can do so with confidence? Um. A lot of it is praise because especially in, in the work I do now and, and honestly to like even back when I was in consulting, like it was 
a lot of digital and like product build type of consulting. So I was working with a different type of designer. And so instead of advertising, we were building, you know, websites and mobile apps, right? So the, the output of the work of the teams I was leading was still very visual. And so I think like the, a lot of it is just the, the building up and the hyping up of the great work that people produce, right? I mean, I've been lucky, you know, in, in the vast majority of jobs I've had to work with incredibly smart and talented people, but you have to, re, you should as a leader, like reinforce that. And so if you see good work, you need to recognize it and you need to get it up and out of the circle of the project you're on. Like if I, if I see something that's really, really freaking good, like I'm picking it up and I'm throwing it to the entire studio, the entire team, the entire like company to say like, oh my God, like, did you see what this person did? Right. I think that's a really big part of it. Um, and the other time is be, I don't want to say be strategic. I was going to say that, but like play with your, like, like be thoughtful about how you spend like downtime with the people you work with. Like when things aren't crazy, you need to be going hard on like the relationship building part of it. And so, especially like in my job now, like we're in the office two days a week, it's, it's about to be three days a week. And so it's like, get lunch with people, get coffee with people, just hang out, you know, actually ask them um, how their weekends and their evenings were and be invested in their answer and, you know, be willing to share a part of who you are and what you enjoy doing. And so it's like, once you build a relationship with someone, right. I mean, imagine it with, you know, your, um, you know, your, your partner and your family, right. If you've, you've got an incredible relationship with that person where you can ask things of them that you can probably not ask of pretty much anyone else on earth, but you've, You've put in the, the commitment and the hours to be able to do that. And I think the same approach can be made um, in you know, obviously non-intimate, you know, working relationships as well. Hmm. That's, that's good. So investing in a relationship, setting the boundaries, giving a little right and yeah. in good faith. And, and what I appreciate about it is what I'm hearing from you is congruency, right? Regardless of the <laughs> question, there's that congruency, yeah. which is really good. Because I remember when I said the Simon Sinek thing, you kind of gave me the look, but then also you're staying congruent with, right, I'm setting these boundaries. So I'm not going to say like, oh, work, uh, oh, the what Simon Sinek said is whatever, but also I'm not then going to look at you and be like, this needs to be your everything. And so there's that congruency and the answers that you're giving are like lining up with that. and I'm And I'm getting a better understanding of kind of the leadership style and, and how that shows up. I guess my my follow-up question, um, actually, I'm going to pause the follow-up questions. With, I just want to pivot, but that's okay. Yeah, so let's do it. So with what you do, um, for folk who are listening, because we have uh, a lot of young listeners, folk who are still in college as well, that Gen yes. Z um, that you're talking about, where, where do you stand in uh, the idea of like quiet, quitting quiet quitting yeah <laughs> that's a good that's a good question um look i think i think if you're at the phase in your career where you want to quiet quit i think you should just quit because i feel like you know if you're in a role where you know a lot of people no one starts a job to, to quite quit it right at least i don't think they do or i don't think you should i think a lot of times mm -hmm the driving like emotional force behind why someone is choosing to quiet quit, which again, to define it from my perspective, at least you let me know if I have a warped view on it, but like, you know, choosing to put yourself in a position or intentionally sort of walking back your level of like investment or involvement in the work you do so that you're kind of, uh, you know, a more passive sort of not even a participant, but just, you're just kind of there. Right. And you're going to do the mm -hmm. absolute bare minimum just above the line of you think what you need to do in order to not get fired. Right. And I think, I think it's bad for a couple of reasons. I mean, life is about like momentum and growth. That's just how I personally yeah. feel about it. And especially if you are in a, a corporate position, right. It's different if you're, you know, flipping burgers at a fast food place, which I've done, you know, it's different if, you know, based on what your job is and where, you know, where, what position of life you're in. But if you're in a professional role, right, you are going to lose out on advancement opportunities if you're not sort of like plugged in in that way. Um, and again, like you just never know what could happen. Like it's interesting you say mm -hmm. quiet quitting because I think, you know, in this post COVID 
work environment we're in, like we saw a couple like sort of rapid shifts where it's like yeah. great resignation, free money era, stimulus payments are popping, right? Everyone's going to become a product manager at Google, right? And they hired all these people. The tail end of that era was sort of quiet quitting where it's like, okay, I've got this job. I'm making my six figure plus salary. Let me chill. Let me coast. Then it's, you know, beginning late 22, early 23, like a lot of these same companies now we're doing layoffs and that sort of still, I would say, is the era in which we're in now where people are very uncertain of whether or not they're going to be able to keep their jobs or not. And so you actually don't like in the, I don't know, in the corporate or like professional America zeitgeist, like you don't hear a lot of people talking about quiet quitting because the thing is like people are uh, nervous about their ability to keep their jobs. And so I feel like, you know, there are times in my life where I was certainly more plugged into the work I was doing or less plugged into the work I was doing based on other parts of my life that were pulling me in different directions, just to be honest with you. But I think like if you're at a point where you're not, you know, excited or really drawn to the work you do, like I think it's time to have that conversation again. Like when you're looking at yourself in the mirror, like where, where are you headed? Where are you going? Um, and you know, the role of sort of work in your, in your life. Yeah. Like I, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm negative quiet quitting, but I am positive finding the proper work environment for your, goals in your like psychology so you know kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> if that can be an answer to this question that that is my answer to that question i think that's an excellent answer and i, I appreciate you took the time to define for you what quiet quitting looks like and and i appreciate that because it lets us compare and contrast what the other things you said which again why I, why i appreciate and why i follow you is there's this congruency where you talked about setting boundaries and mm -hmm. then you didn't confuse setting boundaries with quiet quitting, which is what right. I see sometimes a lot of my colleagues do of like, oh, there, there is that quiet quitting generation. And then when you pull their card and ask them like, well, what are they doing? Well, they're not staying. They're not staying after late to do this. Mm -hmm. and it's like, but mm -hmm. that's that's boundaries. Right. Yeah. Well, it's quiet quitting. It's like, mm, no. Colin just gave a great example of what quiet quitting is. And so I appreciate yeah. you taking the time to explain that, man. Yeah, no. And, and, and again, like the reason I'm, you know, really like I've, I've thought a lot about this, especially because I, I appreciated you bringing up that Simon Sinek quote. And I, you know, I have heard of him and I, I like a lot of what he does. But like the only reason I say that is because I've, I've been that guy. You know, I've been that person where, you know, I defined a lot, a large part of who I was based on, you know, the size of my expense account and the title and, you know, the, the company that I was at. Um, and it, you know, it, it ended, right? Like it wasn't that thing. And I, I chose to leave. Like I ended up quitting that job to go do something else. Um, and I sort of wrestled with for quite some time, like, was this the right choice? You know, what if I don't have this? What if I don't have that? And so I, I think I've, I've had to think a lot about this personally in terms of like, you know, identity versus like how you show up at work. Right. And so I think that like, if you put yourself in the right position, I mean, work should feel, I mean, it, it's going to be stressful, but like you, you need to be thinking about this stuff. Like you can't just chase money. You can't just chase um, chillness or the opportunity to quiet quit. Right. Because like, I think there's, there's a lot more richness to be had out there and we're going to spend so much time. Most people are going to spend so much time of their lives working. Like you might as well be doing something that isn't uh, a great you know, struggle and, you know, stressful thing that you just sort of have to work through for 40 hours a week. Cause that's, I mean, it's a lot of time, right. To do something that you uh, hate most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I think, I think that's true. And kind of figuring out that lane and figuring out that purpose, which is, which is why we asked you to be on the podcast and, and what we do with coaching on what my framework, I call it the essential eight. So like some right. of it, like health harmony, um, personal progression, family fabric, all these, you know, a little, you know, you try to coin Love words that. and phrases and yeah. stuff, but to build a robust picture of your value so that they can steer you to mm -hmm. the things that you want to say yes to, but it can also help you do a better job of saying no to those things. And what I'm hearing from you as a, as a professional, as, as a leader is that's the way in which you lead folk. And that then sounds like the expectation of what you try to establish within your team. And, and I really like that. And I guess for my audience who is just now, you know, they're going to be graduating. Um, I, by the time of this airing out, folk will be getting their cap and gowns ready, yeah. ready to like hit the, you know, hit the whole career scene. 
what advice would you have for those folk who maybe they got their degree in business administration or maybe they did the communication route and maybe they're not looking to be an engineer maybe they want to get into the corporate space right yeah what what would be some advice you would have for them yeah so i think the best the best time to prepare to get a corporate career is probably you know a year and a half to two years before you graduate because you know, ideally you want to stack a couple internships um but i think look i one concept I talk about, you know, in my content that I think is really resonated with a lot of people is the concept of a third door, which is not something I invented. So you can, you know, feel free to take your uh, your three step process to, to to jack this one too. But um, it was by this guy called um, Alex Banian, I think, and he basically says like he he sets it up in the uh, the metaphor of like a, a nightclub. Okay, and so. In this metaphor, the, the first door is general admission. It's got the long line out front. You've got the bouncer. This is where most people that want to get into the club will access through the general admission, right? So you're getting what everyone else gets, and you could be taken out of line at any point. You know, you're in this long line. Um, he defines the second door as like being the VIP door. And so this is where, you know, people who have money access, you know, if you're a Nepo baby, right? Like this is the door that you go in, right? And, you know, I say to my audience, like, if you're watching this video and you follow me, you're probably not getting in through that door, right? That's not the door I had at least, right? And yeah. so I think, you know, the going forward, like the third door um, is, you know, past the VIP door. If you go down the alley, you climb a fence, you go in through a skylight, or maybe you sneak in behind the cook who's out for a smoke break. Uh, maybe it's a doggy door you climb through. Like it's, it's creatively finding opportunities to enter the space you want to get to that, you know, most people aren't aware of, but that may, that may not even exist yet. And so I'll say that like, you know, to, to bring this back to your question, like if you're a new graduate, especially in the job market we're in, and you're trying to get started in the corporate or business space, you need to be looking for third door opportunities to enter into these roles because they exist. They're just not easy to find. And so whether this is, you know, I, I believe that proximity is power. I know that's a whole other thing we could go down in terms of like, you know, remote work versus being in the office, but like, if you're able to physically get yourself in front of the decision makers who um, hire for some of these corporate roles by doing like case competitions, by, you know, doing there may be like a community service event they're putting on, like figure out the places and spaces where these people go and then put yourself in those rooms to sort of get access to them. So you're not just a resume on the wall. Right. Um, you know, a lot of times this is sort of a roundabout answer, but like people could. A lot of times people get aqua hired into consulting firms. And so they may start consulting on their own and then they may build up, you know, a couple of case studies, a couple of resumes, a couple pieces of like specific and nuanced expertise that that consulting firm may not have, or that financial institution may not have. And so they may bring you in because now you have a skill set, especially with the way technology is going. Now you have a skill set that they don't have inside of their organization. And so that's another way in. Um, and so I would say that like, get creative because if you do if you do the things that most people do you'll get the results that most people get right and so like general admission like you're going to get you're going to get bounced or the ats isn't going to read that keyword on your resume right and like all these little tricks that you know um other career influencers on the internet give right they they may or may not work because you're still going through that portal but if you think about mm. getting a job in a much more creative sense like how can you put yourself in front of a decision maker, right? Even to the extent of like, I don't know, this may be like, this is what I did. I mean, look, when I was in college, there was a club I wanted to be a part of that was only open to upperclassmen. So you had to be in the college of business, which you had to test into. So everyone starts out in the general pool and then you test into the actual college where your major is. Um, and there was this club I wanted to be into because every person that got into this club got a job at one of these consulting firms, you were essentially hired out of this club before you even hit like the job market in general. And I wanted that experience. Right. And so I lived on campus and there was a networking event happening at a building, like within walking distance of where my dorm was. And so I put on my suit, I go to this networking event that's only for upperclassmen. And I essentially lie to the person at the door that my, that my, you know, registration didn't go through. So they give me a blank name tag. I write my name on it, right? I lie and say, I'm in this major that I had not even applied to. I was still a freshman. And I end up talking to the professor at that networking event that ran that club. And I was the youngest to date. I still am the youngest person to ever join this organization. And I was the longest tenured person on it. And I, it was essentially the 
the student leader of that club by the time I was a junior, because I'd just been there so long and knew how everything worked, you know? And so I think mm. like, it's literally about, you know, I don't want to say it's about lying and manipulation. That's not the recommendation here. But like, if you can creatively figure out a way to get yourself in the room with the decision maker, you automatically um, have put yourself light years ahead. And don't, you know, while you're still in school, right, if this doesn't come out, you know, and people still have some time, recognize that, you know, that EDU email address is, is power. And a lot of people would do anything for a student. And so if you're not sending cold LinkedIn, if you're not sending, you know, cold Twitter, or the website formerly known as Twitter, right? Like uh, some of these people have, you know, Facebook channels. Like people reach out to me all the time, you know, for opportunities to, to work at the places I've worked at. Um, and some of them have gotten at least into the interview process, right? Like I'm not, you know, that's not something I'm guaranteeing, but um, mm. yeah, just get, get creative, look for third doors and like proximity is, is, is power, especially if you're trying to get a job, you need to get off the internet and go like, meet people face to face proximity is power be creative yeah find that third door i i love that those marry so well because you're not gonna find that third door if you're not creative if you're not thinking kind of outside the box and kind of what you did right totally. right live manipulation to potato <laughs> potato tomato tomato <laughs> yeah. but Right. It was it was this opportunity to get an early start at something. Right. And be one and be one of the longest tenured members of this group that I'm sure helped open some doors. But totally. maybe even if I may, maybe even make people reconsider. Do we have do we fare better if we let younger people in? Exactly. Because then we get more out of them. Right. And sure. I think sometimes we look at the structures or the policies or the quote unquote barriers as immovable. Yeah. When, if you practice creativity and curiosity, you might just not only find a third door, but you might find a third way that then brings in more people. Totally. And I, and like with what I'm hearing from you and kind of how you navigate that is, is really interesting. Um, I, I know we're, probably almost at time, but do I have time for maybe one more question? Of course, man. Of course I'm here. Yeah. My man, I, I would love this. to know. So we talked a lot about work mm -hmm. and, and a lot about career, but even you said your, your career isn't your life. Mm -hmm. So what, what does that life look like for you? How do you manage? I, I, um, um, kind of that work. I call it work life rhythm. How, how, how do you find that. That's I'm okay. See now, like you've, I'm, I'm taking that one. That's good. I'm not even going to give you three. The next time I say that, oh, I've been thinking about this. <laughs> a, it's a rhythm. I like that work life rhythm. Okay. I want to finish, but I, that that's good. I like that. All good. All good. So with, with, with work life rhythm, how, how have you found your rhythm? How have you been able to kind of be in that success and manage the, the family aspect. Cause you're not just the person who works, right? right? You have a partner, um, yeah. you're expecting a, a child and all of that. How, how have you yeah. managed that rhythm? <laughs> yeah. So um, that's, I mean, great question to end on because I would say this is like, that's going to be one of those things where like, I'll, I'll probably never get it a hundred percent. Right. Just to be honest with you, but I'm, but I am trying, I, I would say that, you know, I, I definitely, I, I love the idea of clarifying it as rhythm. And I would say there have been times in life where I've been a little, you know, a little out of tune, you know, with my, uh, my, my work life sort of sync up. Um, but I think it's about the same way you set boundaries and expectations at work. You also have to set those boundaries and expectations with your, your partner or the people in your life that you're close to. Right. Because, and again, you know, my, my wife, she, she works full time. So she's not, you know, at home sort of waiting for me to sort of, you know, be there with her all the time. She's got plenty of stuff in her life as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I think having expectations around like protected time where like, I, I don't care if a meteor is headed towards the office. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, like, I'm not going to be there. Like I've, I've committed myself to this other thing. Um, and I think that's something that's been an evolving sort of thing, but that was one of the, the earlier like concepts that, that me and my wife implemented in terms of like, okay, like, 
like on the weekends and like, you know, we, we do our date nights. We, we try to do our date nights at least once a week, but like on the weekends, especially like it's not a, you know, phones always out, like constant distractions type of thing. And we really sort of like try to lock into each other and sort of take that time. And so I think the same way you protect and, you know, put boundaries up at work, you've got to do that in your personal life as well. And, and, and realize that, you know, it will, it will ebb and flow, right? The, the bridge is different from the chorus, which is different from a main verse, right? And so you've got to realize like what part of the song you're in. So, you know, I'm, this is, how I'm going to take it, right? I'm going to, I'm going to add my own stuff to it. But like, I think in different parts of um, your life, you may need to have different mixes and balances of like, you know, your, your career and your personal life. But the thing to go back to one of the earlier things I said on this podcast is like, you have to be aware of the part of the song you're in so that when you get out of it, you can then go back to reconnect with people. Right. Because I will say something that I have, I think really improved on is like, if I can't make it happen, if I can't make the meet happen, if I can't answer the text or the phone call in like a reasonable time frame, like when I can, I'll, I'll go back and I'll, and I'll admit, you know, like, Hey, like just got through something it was crazy, but like, yes, like let's, let's do the dinner. Let's get the coffee. Let's get the drink. Let's, let's hang the next time, you know, I'm back home in Georgia. Like, like I I'm, I'm getting a lot better at that because I'm now I've, I've been doing this long enough where I can tell, okay, I'm heading into a heavier part of the song in terms of my professional life or, you know, frankly, like with what I'm doing on social media, like that's picking up too. And that's sort of becoming its own sort of separate and secondary and almost equal size of effort, like career. And so I've got to put a lot of time towards that. And so when I know that, like, I know that when mm -hmm. I get out of that or when stuff gets, you know, a little slower, wow. take the time to reach back out to people and like continue to build those threads because you don't want to lose relationships with folks, you know? Yeah, that's good, man. That I, I really enjoyed this conversation because I, I hear a thoughtfulness um, in your answers that these things have been considered and thought out and time has been spent, right? You've, you've taken the time to, it sounds like to set, to set a meeting with your thoughts and to really source out those things. And I really appreciate hearing that also, but I don't appreciate how you took the work-life rhythm. And then you said, everything has a bridge and a core, like, like, bro, don't, don't further expand <laughs> on my concept and make it sound better than what I had. Okay. Yeah. Like it's good, man. That's, that's good. I haven't heard that before. I had to run with it, but yeah, I appreciate that. Oh man. It is all good. But Hey, um, a as we close, how can my audience, um, connect with you, see what you're doing on social media. If you have any things that you're doing, whether it's, um, products or whatever, just how can they sure. connect with you? Yeah. So look, I'm, I'm, I'm everywhere on, you know, mainly Instagram and TikTok as career colon, just one word. Um, I also like welcome, you know, everyone who follows me, uh, or who knows of me to connect with me on LinkedIn. You can just search Colin Rocker. I guarantee you I'll be, you know, the only black guy with that name uh, on LinkedIn. So I'm, I'm very easy to find in that way. Um, and then, yeah, New York, you know, if, if you are sort of here in the tri-state area, I, I like to do at least you know, one, maybe two this year sort of like meetups where I'm able to sort of get out and sort of, you know, touch people's hands and sort of figure out, you know, how I can better serve them in the content I make. And so if you follow me on those platforms, you'll definitely be made aware of um, when those things happen, but they typically happen in, in sort of the later part of the year when we get, you know, a bit, a bit warmer uh, weather here in the city. But yeah, those are the, those are the main things, man. I'm not here to, to sell anything. I've, I've honestly legitimately really enjoyed this conversation. Um, appreciate the community and, you know, the, the minds that you're building and, you know, seems like with your, with your coaching, like you, it's, you're doing really good stuff. So I, again, just like, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this and yeah, man, more, you know, more to, to both of us, you know. Definitely, man. I, I appreciate it. It is all of this way, family inspired house. I, I hope that you've gleaned some really good stuff. Please do us a favor, drop in the comments, what spoke most to you in, in today's episode um, please check us out next week. We got more things as we go through the different rooms of the house. But in the meantime, I'm Desmond. Thank you so much, Colin, for hanging out with us. Family, y'all stay inspired, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace. Mm -hmm.